glad that you've chosen to join us this morning, and some of you are here as guests of those who are being baptized, and we certainly appreciate you being with us today. There's a couple things I just want to say before we actually get into the baptizing of the four that are being done in the 9 o'clock service. Baptism is a step of obedience. Once a person comes to faith in Christ, the next step that the Bible talks about is believer's baptism. And uh, there is nothing magical about the waters of baptism. This is not something that guarantees that you are going to heaven. This is simply a step of obedience. It is a public profession of a reality that exists in each of these four people's hearts. And so this morning we rejoice with these who have chosen to take that step of obedience, to be baptized, to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ, and to publicly state by their act of baptism that they are believers and that they are choosing to follow Jesus Christ for the remainder of their days. We read about baptism in the New Testament, uh, and it's always done after a person comes to faith in Christ. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, uh, the Philippian jailer in the book of Acts, uh, these are all uh, baptisms that occur after a person has come to faith in Christ. And so these that are coming this morning are desiring to take that step of obedience, and we're excited for them. We're going to begin by asking Kevin Weed to come. Kevin, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And upon the profession of your faith, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Savior, and they wish to follow him in obedience to his command.
not do that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is uh, a lot better than some Sunday mornings when we baptize. I've had people come in on the tank and go, <gasps> <laughs> so, this is nice and warm this morning. Cheryl, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Then upon the profession of your faith, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs>
ask you guys this morning. Do you know what time it is? Later than you think. <laughs> Amen? The end is near. So stay in the word. Pastor. Boy, I feel like Clark Kent. <laughs> Change from my alter identity. We're glad you're here. And uh, it's an exciting day as we celebrate with these who have chosen to follow the Lord in obedience to his command. And we know we have guests with us, and we trust that you'll be blessed and encouraged by your time with us this morning, and that you'll come back and visit us again. Uh, I was in such a hurry, I left my mask in the office, so forgive me for not having my mask with me, but I think we're pretty much through that, aren't we? All right. Okay, we have a few announcements to bring to your attention this morning. We'll go right to them. Uh, next Sunday morning, set your clocks ahead. We're springing forward. Uh, we're losing an hour of sleep, so, but you'll be excited to be here regardless. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Uh, we are going to be beginning the next steps class uh, next Sunday. So if you are new to Golden Harvest, you'd like to know more about the church, you're considering maybe membership, we would encourage you to come for the 10 o'clock hour. And uh, this is a three-week session where we talk to you about who we are as a church, what we believe, where we're headed, and how you can fit into the big picture. And uh, if you are interested in membership, this is a precursor to membership. You have to go through this class before you're uh, brought into membership. So we are going to begin that next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock here in the auditorium. Overcomers is coming up March 21st here at the church. That's seniors age 55 and up. And uh, a lot of people who are well past 55 refuse to come to senior or, uh, overcomers because they don't want to admit that they are a senior. So uh, we'll just call you by another name, all right? But uh, just older youth is one option. Uh, but we encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, Pastor Bernie McDale will be our speaker, and uh, we're just looking forward to a good time of fellowship. Uh, Man Up Conference is coming up March 26th at 9.30 in Simcoe, and there is a sign-up sheet in the hallway. We need you to sign up so we can arrange transportation. Uh, and so we're looking forward to a great day. It's, there's no cost to it, and uh, it's just a one-day event this year. And we encourage you to come and be a part of that. Get your spirit filled and uh, get your batteries charged up and just have a great time of fellowship with some other Christian men. Evangelist Calvin Allen is going to be with us Wednesday, March the 30th, the end of the month at 7 o'clock. We're going to have, instead of our regular Bible study on Wednesday night, we're going to have a full-blown service. We'll have special music. We'll have uh, singing. And we're just going to have a good time together. We encourage you to come. If you've never heard of Calvin, you will want to be here. He'll be singing and preaching, and uh, he'll be a blessing and a challenge to you for sure. We are looking for some volunteers. If you're interested in being a part of our Crescent Park Lodge ministry, uh, Kathy Washburn has been given the go-ahead by Crescent Park to begin services again. And uh, I believe that you're involved in it, Bonnie, as well. So you can talk to either Bonnie or Kathy if you're interested in being a part of that ministry. And that's all of our announcements. Danny, if you'll come. Okay, let's stand and sing. Wonderful grace of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. 
used to go from our church in Niagara Falls to a church in Fort Erie to a church in Niagara Falls to have a hymn sing on a Sunday evening. And this, this was the song that we sang. But how we sang it is one of the churches, we all sang the first verse. And then the second verse was sung by the other, the, the church that we were at. And we were competing against each other to see who could sing the loudest, really, is what it was. But uh, I was thinking, you know, I should have divided the church in half here. Because some of you are singing, and some of you aren't singing. Some of you think about singing. <coughs> some of you are singing, and that's fantastic. We're in the presence of the Lord. Let's really sing this out. This song is a, a special song to me, so let me hear you sing it. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the host
it this morning. Uh, it's good to see people following the Lord in obedience to his command. Uh, and each of them, I said before, each of them has their own story. And uh, some of them you don't know too well. You don't know them because they're quiet. I think of Ashley, and she's just quiet all the time, at least at church. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure. Uh, Kevin Weeb is one of our youth workers, and we appreciate so much what he does, and he does our 11 o'clock sound as well. And uh, Dennis and Cheryl, they're just a blessing. Uh, just to see them following Christ and uh, taking this step, we are excited to be a part of it. <clears throat> Take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to Psalm 105. <coughs> Psalm 105, or 145, sorry. <clears throat> we'll be okay. It'll take some time, but we'll be okay. Psalm 145. I was uh, so rushed. Is this on? <clears throat> As being, uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, I was so rushed trying to get in here by the time the singing ended uh, that I just my mind is still in my office, so hopefully we'll get through this in one piece. Psalm 145, and I want to read verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Father, I pray today that you may be with us in these few moments. That you may, uh, Lord, take this passage and help us to fully grasp the depth, the gravity, the holiness of who you are. Father, you are a good God, and we are so grateful for what you are doing in this place, the blessings that you're pouring out. And Father, I pray that you may continue to move and work in each one of our hearts. May you be uplifted and glorified this morning, and may our hearts overflow as we leave this place today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When you stop to think about the Lord uh, and who he is, a lot of different thoughts will come to mind. And we can define him in so many ways. He is good. He is great. He is gracious. He's merciful. He's loving. He's long-suffering. He's self-sacrificing. He is giving. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. And he is all all present, present everywhere at once. We know that through his word and intellectually, we are aware of who he is. As we read the scriptures, as we talk amongst ourselves, as we hear messages preached, we are aware up here of who God is. But periodically down here, we forget. Because we are surrounded by a world that has lost its collective mind. Everything seems to be falling apart at the seams, and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to anything. And so many times, we can become anxious. We can become filled with care and concern over what is going on around us. Are we going to see World War III? Is the stock market going to collapse? Are we going to, to totally go into another depression? These things are all part of what we think of on a day-to-day -day basis, especially given the current climate. And I think it's important for us at a time like this that we be reminded of just who God is, Amen. just who he is and how much he cares for each and every one of us, because he is good, he is gracious. Here David gives us a psalm of praise for God's greatness to mankind. So I want to examine this morning four things that define God in such a way that he is, as it were to David, a wonder, awe-inspiring, and indeed in our lives, he is a great God. And so we begin in verse 8. David lists a few things here. The first is, he says, the Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. Being gracious is part of God's character and makeup. 
Within the doctrine of grace, we find that God shows unmerited favor upon his creation. That is, that God does not show favor to only a select few, not a certain special group, but he shows his grace and his favor to all humanity. The fact that we are living in a beautiful surroundings and the, the temperature is nice and mild today and the sun is shining is part of God's gracious treatment of his creation. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In that verse, Jesus explains God's concern for all by saying that God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son. And the purpose that Jesus came to this earth was not just to live a good life amongst us and to set a perfect example. It was that he may pay sin's penalty once and for all. That he may provide a way where God's creation can once again be redeemed or reconciled to God. And that is an evidence of the fact that God is gracious. He is gracious. He loves us, though we are unlovely, though we do not deserve it. The scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek when it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ. The same Lord is over all. He loves each and every one of us individually. It doesn't matter if you were raised in church or if you've never darkened the doorstep of a church before. God loves you and sent his son to die for you. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. It doesn't matter if you are a member of the Kiwanis Club or the Optimist Club or if you do a great deal of community service. It doesn't matter what you do because we all stand before God as sinners in need of a Savior. In verse 1 of Psalm 145, David says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. You know, we could spend the rest of the day and not adequately explain to you who God is or how gracious he is, how good he is. The world in which we live uh, looks at God this way. <clears throat> they say, my life is falling apart. I've got problems here and there. I've got cancer. I've got financial problems. I've got this going on in my life. If God is good, why? Are these things taking place? If God loves me, why is he allowing such and such to take place in my life? My friends, I want you to understand from Scripture, God's goodness is not dependent on our circumstances. What's going on in my life right now does not reflect on who God is or how good he is or how much he loves me. The fact of the matter is this. You and I live in a fallen world. In Genesis, Adam and Eve disobeyed God and took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in, in contravention of what God told them to do. And at that moment in time, sin entered into the world. From that moment on until today, sin has continued to progress to the point that our bodies now are corrupted. The creation around us is corrupted. We are seeing things happen today in nature that we've not seen before. Beginning of March, and a tornado sweeps through Utah, or Iowa, I guess it was Iowa, and kills, I don't know, I've heard up to nine people. The war in Ukraine, the situation with the pandemic, the proliferation of cancer in our society. You know, when I was young, <clears throat> and I know, I know, that was when the earth was young and 
the ark had just landed on Ararat. Abraham was a youngster. But when I was young, I grew up in a small town, and there was one woman in our town that had cancer. One woman. And it was big news to everybody back then. She was on this special diet, and everybody was, was catering to her and talking to her and worried about her. And now, if you meet a person that doesn't have cancer, it's amazing. The world is gradually falling apart. And if you don't believe that, if you think that it's getting better and better, then turn on the news and watch it just for a minute because the world around us is not getting better. But the fact of the matter is this. God is still gracious. God is still full of mercy. God still extends that mercy to anyone that will come to him by faith. God loved the world. And now whosoever believes in his son will have everlasting life. Whosoever believes in Jesus is not ashamed. And whosoever calls upon his name will be saved. The second thing we see in this verse about the Lord is that he is full of compassion. Another way of saying this is to say that God is long-suffering. Unlike you and I, who sometimes have to really work hard at getting along with others, God is long-suffering. He is kind beyond measure. You know, uh, I'll just be honest with you here, and, and I, I know my heart, and I know that my heart's not a lot different than most of you, so some of y'all can sit there looking pious, but I know that we're all made of the same stuff. There are times... And I know I'm a pastor. I know I shouldn't say this. But there are times where I look at people and I say, what are you doing? And why are you complaining about your lot in life? You made that decision and now you're reaping the consequences. I find it hard to be compassionate towards some people. Right? Are you shocked? Now it's your turn. You can be honest. How many of you struggle out with that as well? All right. Most of you are honest. The rest of you need to come to the altar to close in service for life. We all struggle with, with being compassionate. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patient, and he's compassionate. And you know what? I can testify to that in my own life because there are times in my life when I wonder why God permits me to just carry on. There are times in my life where I think, how can God put up with me, with my attitude, with the condition of my heart? But he is compassionate. He is loving and praise God, he is patient. Amen? Do some of you all need some patience? We find it difficult to understand God's methods or God's ways. And we need to accept that God knows exactly what he's doing. He knows who we are better than we know ourselves. And he is aware of everything going on in your life. And what is happening in your life right now is not God's fault. You live in a fallen world. You live in a world that is falling apart at the seams, and it's not God's fault. You know, too often we think of God as being a cosmic puppet master that sits in the heavens and just controls everything. I don't know how we can think that. We've kicked him out of everything in our world. We've kicked him out of our schools. We've kicked him out of our government. We've kicked him out of our society. Why should God be a puppet master and control us? We don't want anything to do with him. But yet he loves us. Yet he is compassionate. Yet he is loving. David says in verse 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger. Thirdly, slow to anger. <coughs> How many of you 
understand that anger is a human emotion that interferes with our service to God. Anger is not something that most of us are proud of or that when we're talking about how we handle situations, most of us wouldn't say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty quick to get angry. We try, try, to, try to hide that from those around us. But many of us are. And if you don't believe that to be true, take a drive down to QEW. All right? Because you will find it welling up inside of you or the guy beside you is about ready to run you off the road. God is slow to anger. And I'm so grateful he is. Because he has every justification for being angry and upset and destroying this old world and everybody in it. But yet he is slow to anger. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 4 verses 30 through 32 that anger grieves the Holy Spirit. Therefore, rather than being a vessel that God can use, you become a person so hard-hearted that God cannot use us. Anger is a barrier to love, especially the demonstration of God's love. Because we allow it to build up in our hearts, we'll get upset with someone and it begins to manifest itself in the way that we conduct ourselves amongst others. Our attitude becomes harsh and uncaring. Our words become hard and cold. But God is slow to anger. Paul told the Romans in Romans 12, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That means don't give back. When someone wrongs you, don't get back at them. Don't try to get even. Don't try to get revenge. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. You and I are instructed, rather, to return kindness for evil, to do good in the face of wrong, to treat others the way we would want to be treated, and not be quickly angry. Remember, God is slow to anger. He loves us so much that he keeps giving us another opportunity to please him, another opportunity to follow him, another opportunity to do the right thing. And fourthly, this morning, the Lord is of great mercy. Mercy means that God does not give us what we deserve. Get that? Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. You know what we deserve? And we live in a day when everybody is talking about their rights and, and I have the right and my rights have been violated. You know what you and I deserve this morning? We deserve hell. We deserve the wrath of God. But yet, God is of great mercy. He does not give us what we deserve. But rather, he extends his love toward us in that if we will come to him and if we will trust him as our Savior, place our faith in his finished work, he says he will forgive us. God's mercy is demonstrated all around us. In the blessings that he bestows upon us day after day after day. Praise the Lord. For the fact that God is gracious, that he is full of compassion, that he is slow to anger, and he is great in mercy. Amen. But look at verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Putin cannot change the fact that God is good. Amen. Coronavirus cannot change the fact that God is good. The circumstances that you are facing in your life at this moment in time cannot change the fact that God is good. He is good all the time. 
In every circumstance, in every trial, in every testing, in every hardship, he is good. We just need to keep our focus on him. Keep looking to him. Keep following after him. You know, when I started this message, my intent was just to go through a variety of different psalms and look at different aspects of what the Lord does for us. In Psalm 3, verses 3 through 8, we see that the Lord sustains us. In Psalm 7, verses 9 and 10, it says the Lord defends us. In Psalm 18, verses 1 to 3, it says the Lord strengthens us. In Psalm 31, verses 1 through 3, it says the Lord leads us and guides us. Praise the Lord today for his grace and his mercy, his loving kindness, his compassion, his patience with each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. God is a good God. That is revealed by his character and by the treatment of his creation. The question today becomes this. Is he your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted him? Are you in a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know him today? You know, there is a world around us that desperately needs some hope. And it's not going to come from the health department. And it's not going to come from the government. The hope that this world needs is in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know what? I'll go so far as to say this. It's not going to come from religion. Huh? It's not going to come from religion. Because what I'm talking about this morning is not religion. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. I'm talking about a relationship with the God of the universe. I'm talking about walking with the one who made us and who is coming back for us. Amen. Amen. The Lord is. What is he to you this morning? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Have you come to the point in your life where you've repented of your sin and turned to him in faith and accepted his finished work? May we never lose sight of his goodness. And trying to follow after him and be like him. And may we treat others the way the Lord treats us. May we treat others with tenderness and love and forgiveness and mercy and patience. My friend, if you're here today and you have never trusted Christ, The Bible says in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We read in 2 Peter this morning that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's mercy and grace is extended to each and every one of us this morning. Have you experienced it in your own life? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time together. For those that have been baptized this morning, we give you thanks and praise. We pray your richest blessing upon them as they seek to live for you. And Father, I pray today that if there is one here today that has never trusted Jesus Christ, that today they may sense the Holy Spirit's call. That they may open their heart. Place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed this morning and our eyes closed. No one's looking around. Let me ask you a question. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I'm not sure if I were to die today that I would be in heaven. But I'd like to have that hope and that peace in my heart and life. Will you just pray for me as you close the service? I'm not going to call you out and embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. So if you'll slip your hand up. No one's looking around. Just slip your hand up and down. Pastor, would you pray for me? I need Jesus today. Sure, one. 
Maybe you're here today and you've forgotten just how good God is because you've been consumed by this world and everything that's going on in it. And you would say simply, Pastor, would you remember me in your closing prayer? I need to keep being reminded of who God is. That I may follow him more closely. Is there one? Amen. Amen. Father, I do pray for these that have raised their hands. I pray, Father, that you may speak to them, that you'd be especially near to them, that they may sense your presence, or that each and every one of us here today would understand very clearly that you are a great God, that you are merciful and compassionate, that you are slow to anger, and that you are full of grace. Father, I pray that those are the things that we may remind ourselves of day after day as the world falls apart around us. Lord, may we not be consumed with anxiety, but may we truly exhibit the peace of God that passes all understanding. We pray these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing in closing, O oh, Happy Day. Thank you.